Good morning. My name is Bob Beatty, and uh, I have a small company called O-Ring CNG Fuel Systems. We're located in Cool Spring, Pennsylvania, which is uh, in Jefferson County, uh, Punxsutawney area. So we're from Western Pennsylvania. I've got a couple questions before I even start this morning. We know how many elected officials are in the room, but I'd like to see a show of hands, or rather stand, how many veterans are in this room? It was Veterans Day Monday. Please stand up for a minute. Every veteran in the room. Thank you for your service and God bless you. How many American citizens in this room? Come on. I'm not an ICE agent. Put your hands up. <laughs> Common denominator here. Why are we going to do this? Why do we need to do this? I could talk about fueling stations that we've built for ourselves. I could talk about fueling stations that we've built for other customers. And I could talk about the technology all day. The technology is here. It works. What we need to focus on is why it makes sense to do this. And you've heard the economics from my distinguished colleagues over here. We could talk about it works. It makes financial sense. We could talk about the environment. It's definitely cleaner. My whole focus on this, or my driving force, if you will, behind this is national security. When we stop and think about it, the last person standing on the planet with the most energy wins. And it's as simple as that. Our economy, everything we do is driven by energy. And if you fall in the rut that people fall into, by listening to our news agencies, CNN, Fox, whoever it might be, your local news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle that we see every day tells us that we import roughly 67% of our oil. And we have to do that. There's just no way around that problem. We're so conditioned that we have to import that oil. Well, if you stop and think about what 67% means, to our national economy. Does anyone have a guess or an idea of how many dollars per minute we send across the pond that doesn't come back? As of yesterday, $1.2 million per minute we send across the pond. $1.2 million leaves our economy every minute of every day, every year. And it's a growing problem. Yet. We only use 9% of the natural gas that's under our feet as I'm speaking here right now. In the tri-state area, we have enough fuel under our feet to become the next Saudi Arabia to the world. And if the estimates are even close to accurate, we have more natural gas than the entire Middle East has oil and oil reserves. That's proven reserves. That's not speculation. What does that translate into? that if I could snap my fingers right now and we could take every internal combustion engine on the planet from trains, planes, automobiles, planes are a little impractical, motorcycles, off-road, on-road equipment, mining equipment, by all the estimates we have a 150-year supply of sustainable energy under our feet. So why are we buying it from people that don't like us? It doesn't make any sense. We have a lot of elected officials in the room. No matter which side of the political fence you're on or what your political persuasion is, there's one thing we can all agree on, that we, as taxpayers, buy the guns, bullets, ammunition, body armor, and fuel and everything for our troops that are serving at home and abroad, for our common good, our national defense. But everyone in this room is also a taxpayer in some form or another. And that we're all sharing in that equally. But we're also energy consumers. Everyone in this room, every time we buy a gallon of foreign produced oil, we're supporting the other side. We're buying the guns, bullets, ammunition, body armor, and everything that they're shooting back at us. And there's absolutely no reason to do it. We can replace roughly 20 to 30 percent of the foreign oil tomorrow if we just wake up and do it. And that's why most of you are in this room. Uh, you have an interest in this. 
where do you fit in? Maybe you're not a fleet owner. You can't go out and refuel 100 trucks on an alternative energy source. Maybe you're a potential petroleum dealer like some of the people we heard about today that sells conventional fuels already. You can do your part by converting to alternative energy and making it available to the people in your community. That's where it has to start. This is a grassroots, homegrown energy source that we can take care of, we're in control of, and we don't have any middlemen or foreign governments that we have to prop up and support to do it. It can sustain itself for 150 years. One of the questions I always get, well, if we spend the money to convert and we go to this alternative energy source, the price of it's just going to go up to $4 a gallon like conventional fuel. Well, that's not a fact either. That's a myth. If you look at foreign oil, you can put it on a boat and basically dump it any place on the planet within three or four days. It can go on a tanker and be easily shipped from continent to continent. Natural gas, however, is a little more difficult to get off the American continent and ship at other places. Yes, we're doing it in the form of LNG, pressurized CNG, but by all estimates, the infrastructure is going to take 15 to 20 years to be able to efficiently and economically have it compete on a world market. So what does that mean to us? That while oil is going to sustain a, a north of $80 a barrel price, natural gas will stay in that 4 to $5 in MCF range. What does that translate into in the pumps? Yesterday, natural gas closed at about 368 in MCF. One MCF of gas makes approximately eight gallons of motor fuel as we see it. If the price of gas goes up a dollar in MCF, north of four bucks, say it goes to five bucks, that's about 12 and a half cents at the pump. There is no reason not to get involved and believe that this is going to happen. So from a sustainability point, it's there, it can be done. From a national security perspective, it makes absolute perfect sense. The economics makes sense. Why aren't we doing it? Well, as Mike said, the chicken or the egg theory. The car dealers, the automobile producers don't want to produce the vehicles in mass until we have a lot of stations out there to support it. The station builders don't want to build the stations till we see the vehicles. Well, that chicken and egg theory is disappearing. We have an omelet in Pennsylvania. You can actually drive a natural gas vehicle anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania and get back home by fueling at another station. I've built four of my own stations and I've worked with 16 other fleets to build other fleet and public stations. Giant Eagle's doing the same thing. Chesapeake Energy's doing it in the eastern part of the state and the northern part of the state. It's coming. This is bigger than the next industrial revolution. This is a real game changer not only for the local economy, but a game changer for our region, our state, which by the way, we're about three to four years ahead of everybody else in, in the area, uh, adjoining states. We're not ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, I'm sad to say that Bangladesh ranks higher than we do with natural gas vehicles. We're in the top 25, but barely. But a lot of the countries that we categorize as third world countries, woke up a long time ago and realized what was happening. And without being insulting, it's just time for everybody to wake up, don't be fat, dumb, and happy. We have to do this. If we do not do it, our worst fears are going to come true. That LNG and CNG is going to get exported because it needs sold someplace. We have a three to five year window to take advantage of this opportunity that can be, mean economic growth for everyone. And if we don't, those companies have to make a profit, and they will make a profit by exporting that clean, abundant resource if we don't use it. It makes absolutely no sense to export a clean, green, abundant, inexpensive energy and continue to import the dirty, costly energy. But yet we do it every day. Now, without t sounding too negative, I've seen uh, unusual and extraordinary cooperation. With 32,000 stations needing to be built 
just to capture 10% of the market. People are coming out of the woodwork to build stations. You know, I've built four of my own. Like I said, I've built, built them for other people. We're seeing cooperation within the industry. We don't view each other as competitors, from the gas companies and utility companies to the drillers to the people building stations to the vehicle converters. It's a cooperative effort, and it's going to continue to be because it's going to take five to ten years to make this game changer happen. So I just wanted to kind of tie it all together. Where do we fit in this puzzle if you're not a fleet owner? Well, as an entrepreneur, we're always looking for opportunities, whether you're looking as an opportunity to invest money in something, whether you're looking at an opportunity to save money in your business, or whether you just want to do some good for the community. I was astounded when Robbie called me a couple weeks ago and said she bought that Honda Civic. Uh, she just went out on a limb, so to speak, and said, I'm going to do this. I have to drink my own milk, so to speak. If I'm going to preach it and I'm going to go out and tell other people to do it, I have to be doing it. And that's the kind of spirit we need everybody to take about this. If we don't, someone else will do it, and we're going to scratch our heads in a couple years and say, what did we let pass us by? So we're going to be here to answer panel questions. I've used my allotted time, so uh, I just want to close with saying we, you know, we need to use this or we're going to lose it. And we need to take, uh, I paraphrased a, a quote from Ronald Reagan last night. He said that government needs to look at the world through the eyes of an entrepreneur. That when government or people or businesses view things as problems, the entrepreneur views those problems as an opportunity. We have a huge opportunity here right now, and we need to take advantage of it. Thank you.